Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Kentro Lodro Taye Ripoche, who's here to share with us his new book, The Power of the Mind, a Tibetan monk's guide to finding freedom in every challenge. Also here today with us is Paloma Lopez Landry, who's here to translate Rinpoche's words from Tibetan to English for us. So Rinpoche is a Tibetan monk and the director of Katag, which is a nonprofit organization based in the U.S. He oversees more than 20 practice groups across North America and in China, Australia, and South Africa, as well as a retreat center in Northwest Arkansas. And he's one of the very few people in the world to hold three degrees, which are the equivalent of three PhDs in Buddhist philosophy. So welcome to the show, Rinpoche. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak with you. Well, thank you. It's such an honor to have you here to talk about your new book. What was the inspiration for this book? Uh, so in general, this is um, a, a teaching on working with the mind that we call Lo Jong, which I have been training in since a very young age. And so it's been one of my kind of closest sort of heart practices. And then I came to the United States almost 20 years ago. And um, during this time, one of the principal teachings that I gave as I traveled and taught was mind training. And I have found that it is one of the most powerful and effective teachings that anyone can take up and use to benefit their lives. So why is it important for us to tame our minds? Oh, Gatutsotnambachila <laughs> So the importance of mind training is because when we just let our mind kind of be in its sort of natural or wild state, then we are completely overrun by all of our thoughts and emotions and mental states like a wild horse. And um, and we have no um, ability to to work with our mind and circumstances in ways that are effective and beneficial. And so on the one hand, then there's the need to learn to work with our mind to change our experiences. And on the other, then we also find ourselves in a time period where there is a lot of kind of degeneration in in behavior, in outer circumstances, but particularly in our mind, what we call in Buddhist philosophy, they say that a time of the five degenerations, of which one of them specifically is of our disturbing emotions, a time where we have much more amplified 
greater disturbing emotions, and then, you know, subsequent um, harmful and negative behaviors. And so when we look at changing our experience, then the principal factor that determines it is our mind, not the conditions or circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that's why it's indispensable that we learn how to work with our mind, what we call taming the mind or transforming the mind, mind training, because the majority of why and how we suffer over the hardships and challenges that we face is actually the mind, is our mental suffering over those circumstances. And the only thing that can truly and completely dispel the suffering of mind is mind. Mind frees itself from its own suffering. And that's what mind training methods are about, the mind learning to free itself from its own mental suffering and affliction. And no external circumstance or other condition has the power to do that. When we talk about our mind and our perception, is it really kind of shifting how we look at things? Lo Jong Shei Tu wants to say some more thought on your beauty or she don't kind of take them to it. Oh, then you got to yum yum to get to your wa. Gimson carried his in a net. She don't got to see now. Deva don't can down, Dunger Menton Kayimba, Tamchit, Chipari, Semchinchi in Sarnibs of the Torna de Yuri. Deep shed nana, uh, Lo Jong to. Ranasosushitapnana, Semkinola, Jude Chimbochi, Tokyore, Tendip Shini, David Sorna de Medni, Mano, David Sorna de Shum, Shumata, Dave Gento, a Dunger Katsorna Tamchit, the Metroete, or Tendik Yam or Tapravach Yongriores, Jambi can Kanga to now Shiro King of Toki, Nurtavich Yontokio Mares. So, yes, when we change our perception or when we change the way in which we relate to any given circumstance or experience, then our experience is changed, is fundamentally transformed. And the entire basis of looking at our mind and how it affects our experience is the fact that all of us, no matter who we are as a living being, we want to experience well-being. You can call that happiness or joy or pleasure, but the full spectrum of well-being. And none of us wants to experience any kind of pain, any kind of physical or mental suffering or discomfort. And essentially, all sentient beings then have this same wish. We want to have pleasant or positive sensations, and we don't want unpleasant or painful sensations. And so that is the purpose of mind training is recognizing that each of us has this wish for well-being and to not suffer, and then seeing how the primary role that determines this in any given circumstances is our mind. And that when we work with our mind, then what we are doing is we are kind of changing our experience from the inside out in decreasing the negative thoughts and emotions and flaws of our mind. And as those ways of relating to things through negative thoughts and emotions, essentially perceptions, decrease, then our well-being, our peace, and our way of responding and such increases. And so mind training is a process of decreasing our negative thoughts and emotions that we react with and increasing our positive qualities so that we have different positive ways of thinking about and relating and perceiving things. And those positive qualities, when our mind is 
the, those qualities, then it experiences greater peace and well-being naturally. And then naturally we suffer over things less. And so the mind training is this of, you know, decreasing our suffering, increasing our well-being through that process of changing our thoughts and ways of relating to things. And that is something that changing our external circumstances can never bring for us. Nothing out there in the world has the power to affect us so much as our own mind. It seems that we're constantly being tossed around the waves of either happy or sad emotions. Something happened, I'm happy. Something really bad happened, now I'm sad. So how do we get to this place of balance with our emotions? Oh, Environment So the first part is just acknowledging like exactly what you said about where we find ourselves right now, you know, an ocean of negativity is a good example of just like the intensity of what's taking place in society and on the earth where there's all of this external turbulence and then there's this internal turbulence. And so we have, you know, we're in a time where there's a lot of destruction of the environment and natural disasters that are occurring due to its uh, healthy decline. And then likewise, internally, our minds are disturbed. And then we have, you know, on top of that, it's compounded by uh, pandemics and sickness. And um, and so we find ourselves just with this internal agitation, external ex- agitation. And more than ever, we need to learn how to have kind of ownership of our own mind so that it's not completely controlled by and just consumed by the circumstances. And um, And that is something that everybody needs to begin to develop a skill in is owning their own mind and their own mental afflictions and negative thoughts and so forth. Because if we don't do that and we solely rely on those external circumstances and just constantly, endlessly kind of chase after them, then there's no kind of way to solve our issues. And so much of what is taking place has to begin within ourselves. And especially mind training is a technique. The the Lojong teachings are especially powerful for our present day and age because they have very special teachings that focus on how to carry adversity into the path, meaning to transform our adverse circumstances into something positive and it has a lot of unique methods therein. Um, 
呃,天你,当上,妈妈不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不,不
তাতে আচু কম চিকলা সের তো কিন মেদ মেদনি মজেয়াটি সেমজেয়াটি ছাত সমালা মরগাবি দুঃখী কমনি নগেও পাতে আচু হাকো ইরে আচু মরগাবি কংসক চিকলা কংসক তি কাছা কংসক তি লি কা তে মরগা চিকলা ইন রং ওয়ার তো না তেস্তার তো কমনি সৌনা রং ওয়ার তো তেস্তার তো কমনি কমনি সৌনা কারে সকলে যে না কংসম চিকলা ও দুঃখ মত পাচেক কাতং কাতং ছমা ডি সেম জোরে তো ইউর খরং কুন মারে চৌমাতে কার রে না রং সেম কুমসুর কুয়ংরে তিব সে নাঙি গেম্বর তো হিডিং মাপি চেখেম কংরে যে জেনা চেচম কু মরগাবি দুঃখী কমনা জেরে চালা নোটপা মং জে লং চিগে তে নামছি নি থাকু নোরে ইবা সেম খরং কী দোস তং এক পোচি হাকো সোনা গাছ উনি কাঙ্গার তো দুঙ্গর কংলা ম পোল গুই গেম সারে এন চিক মি তাম থামছে কুসাম লোক তো নাম ম পো তো দুঙ্গর মা পো তো নিম নোপা মা পো তো সেমঠের মা পো তো ইমুক না থা ডিপ্রেশন তে সো হালিপা মা পো চি গুই গেম সো মারা সোসু সেম কোর তো এক পোচি হি নি থাবলাম তো নুবু ছু নি তো থাম চি সোনা নি পর ফানো ছেম পোচি তিউ ছেম পোচি তো জিব দে তো পালা রে ভাই ওরে Today. So Ramesh said, yes, Miriam, exactly as you said, then that's kind of the basis of beginning to understand how we have to learn about our mind. Because in reality, whether we experience um, adverse conditions as being bad or something that is good is not the condition itself, but it's actually our mind. And then on top of that, if we build this habit for constantly disliking things, it's like we build the habit for the perception of dislike. And whatever we're habituated to then becomes our reality. And so then we start to dislike one thing and another thing. And pretty soon, then our dislike and discontent grows. It's kind of like if you focus on something you dislike about an individual, then every day you think about it and you dwell on it, then it becomes bigger and bigger. And then you have more and more of this uh, level of animosity. And at a certain point, you can't kind of overcome it because it's just become so big in your mind due to its focus. And so then uh, anything in the world can become the greatest suffering we've ever experienced, just dependent upon how much our mind focuses on how much it dislikes it. And then not only do we build the habit with that one thing, but then because we build the habit to perceive in terms of dislike, then we eventually start seeing everything as we're finding what we dislike in everything, seeing the flaws of everything. And eventually everything is our enemy. Everything is always adversarial and not okay with us. And we simply hate on everything. So that's like the first step of recognizing, then we have to acknowledge that the dislike itself is one of the primary causes of suffering. And um, as the texts say, the more sensitive we are, the more vulnerable to harm we are, which is to say that the more that we dislike things, the more likely we're going to dislike and experience being harmed by things. And so that is the first kind of basis of recognizing that much of our hardship and our suffering then is because of our habituation to dislike. And then how much we suffer over things is also proportionate to how much we dislike them. And um, a lot of we are kind of perpetuating the turmoil in the world by continuing to hate on the suffering, to, to hate on the circumstances, to hate on the things, to worry about it, to have anxiety about it, um, depression, uh, anxiousness, and so forth, loneliness, all of these things come about and we're just kind of exasperating them 
by not really understanding how our mind works and then per perpetuating these habits. And so the first step is recognizing the role that our perception plays in our experience and habituation and wanting to make a change, being willing to give up hating on suffering. <laughs> Te <laughs> Then you nipa the carriers in Ona Tangohina, Tangatu Karigu Hunduzena, Natsu Sem de la Nurtop Jimzogu, Sem Korang la Korang Nurtop Prungu. Take Karigu Yores and Anne, uh, then he, uh, Murgavin Dukikomna, Gupa Savani Nime Patang, Guba Mepa Mazet, Murgavin Dukir Chik Yot Nayan, Tela Teni, Semnang Dungar Mapo Chikang, uh, Kin <laughs> Ken Tamchabshiriate, Hargutsey <laughs> Rana Sosu Gimsen Katoni, Sam no Pani, Sonayan, Rupi Tribiopa, Nyam Yonka Tribiopa, Jila, Tugore, Marijenton, the Karchembo Ferry Sam, the Uze Tanza Tutsotala, Tenikaran Tavakarion. So the first thing is that we need to kind of become aware of this, like how our mind operates, how it affects our experience, um, thinking about it logically, reflecting on our own personal experience you know, just as I've been speaking about. And so the first step, now step number one, then is to recognize that as much as we dislike on things, as much as we hate on things or think I don't like or I'm not okay, is directly proportionate to how much we are going to suffer over things. So that's step one, acknowledging the role that our mind plays that is much greater actually than the actual conditions. And so then the second step, as soon as, you know, we acknowledge that is then to kind of reinforce and generate a strength of mind. We want to empower our mind. And so we go through a process where 
we actually want to think about this on a regular basis. How then the perception, like whenever we dislike something, we acknowledge this perception of dislike does not benefit me. Not only does it not benefit me, but as much as I dislike on this is going to be how much I suffer over it. It's going and and the, that dislike, the more that we justify why we're not OK with something, the more that our disturbing emotions grow around it. And so basically, we're just compounding our experience by justifying how right we are to not like it. And then we have more and more disturbing emotions. We have more and more suffering and unhappiness over it. And we're more likely to you know, engage in negative or um, you know, unfavorable actions due to that. And so we then for, recognize this is the flaw of disliking. And that's the first step. And then the second step is to generate kind of an, to empower our mind because the dislike disempowers our mind and causes us to become under the power of disturbing emotions. So then we want to empower our mind. So we acknowledge that disliking doesn't benefit us and it only creates more suffering. The second then is that we think, okay, I'm going to empower my mind, which is that to make a resolve, no matter what unfavorable condition occurs, I will be okay. I can bear it. Bear it meaning I don't have to be disturbed over it. I can tolerate it without being disturbed. I can be okay, essentially. And we want to build a habit of that, like on a daily basis, again and again, we recognize that the dislike is the source of our, uh, it doesn't benefit us, causes affliction and think then I can be okay. I'm going to build a capacity of mind because the more easily disturbed we are, then the more vulnerable we are to harm. So basically, as much as we dislike things is going to be how much we suffer in life. And that just grows on itself. And reinforces itself. So we want to change that habit and start to think I can be okay. And we start with the tiny little things, the things that are insignificant, that irritate us, that we are unhappy about, that we just kind of dislike. We start there and with that sense of I'm okay. As soon as the dislike arises, we're like, I don't have to be disturbed over this. And then slowly what happens is if we keep building this habit of recognizing that the flaw of, of disliking and then the thought, I can be okay, I don't have to be disturbed, is it gradually our mind's capacity to be okay, to not be disturbed by things and not be harmed by things grows. And so less and less disturbs us. And our capacity to be undisturbed, which is in this uh, philosophy called patient forbearance, grows. And we keep making that intention. I vow to be okay. I vow not to be disturbed. And as our mind becomes more empowered and is less disturbed by the small things, then bigger and bigger things don't cause harm to it. And so we become less vulnerable to harm. We're going to be, there will be less things that upset us over time. And so it's really about building those small habits on a daily basis and just being really persistent with this. And then gradually our mental capacity grows and we can think of it like exercise, like their physical body if we exercise our physical body, then so then, for example, when we don't exercise, we have little tolerance to carry weight or to do certain things and we can't do it. So our body is more vulnerable to harm, to becoming sore or injured. And then when we exercise by doing repetitive movements and trainings, then the muscles of our body grow and become conditioned and so forth. And then they're less vulnerable to harm and they're stronger and able to carry more without hurting and so forth. And our mind is really exactly the same. The, the We want to exercise it. And the more that we strengthen our mind, the less that we're going to be harmed and upset by things. And so it begins when we really recognize that much of our experience is dependent on our mind. And that starts with a willingness to stop hating on things, to stop disliking things, and then to grow our kind of resolve to be more tolerant and less disturbed by things. And so um, this is something that I think is really important for everyone, especially in our current times. This is not specific to a religious belief. This is something that's based on logic and reasoning that accords with our basic reality. And everyone could be benefited by developing this.
<laughs> Thank you. That I really appreciate you going through that and explaining that. I think it helps us to really understand where we what would be a better place for us to come from, just not this um, judgment on things like dislike, you know, stay in a path where we can get to a place of no judgment. Yes. <laughs> Very good. And you said something in your book that really stuck with me. And you talk about we operate under false assumptions, believing that things will stay the same each moment. And I can understand how true that could be. You know, we think, oh, things are going so good or things are going so bad. It's always going to be that way. Some <laughs> The <laughs> Running Tenny I'm not sure if you have a question there, but um I could add a little bit to that, which is that we tend to live in this state of constant hope and fear and our mind is bound by our hopes and fears which really tie into our kind of belief that there's a permanent situation whether it's good or bad and and so we are constantly perceiving things opposite to how they are and then we're in this struggle because thing there is no permanent situation there's nothing that's constant whether it's good or bad and so then especially like we have good circumstances and then we want to keep them like that and we expect that for some reason even though it has no bearing on reality that those when it's good that it should stay that way and so essentially we're perceiving it as if it were literally permanent when, because the nature of reality is such that it's impermanent, then it's inevitably going to change. And a big part of our suffering is because we want something to stay the same. And when it doesn't, and our expectations kind of fail us, then we're shocked and we suffer enormously over it. And so, you know, and... You know, when the the good circumstances change and, you know, maybe we have a loss of wealth or a loss of good health or work or whatever it might be in our life. Basically, when change happens, we often are kind of shocked. But if we had already perceived and related to that circumstance as being um, impermanent, then when it would happen, we wouldn't be shocked and we would have a lot less suffering over the fact that it did inevitably and eventually change. And so just kind of preparing ourselves for the reality of things by always relating to them with the mindset of their being impermanence is profoundly impactful on our lives. And again, just as we've been speaking about, that is all just a way of thinking. 
In your book, you talk about impermanence, and I'd love for you to share the meaning. We'll kind of break it down for our listeners for us. Martha <laughs> Zoni Sonane, Sekurchik Topi Yulane, Kachima, Mampochi Zoyori, Tinanka, Hachanka, Tutsu Tonku, Mama Chingatsu Semku Jetavia Guarka, Tutsu Hachanka Tonku, Kachimi Matapa, said the Tumupuchuni Tunduku, Mubuchuni Koran Tere, the Dushin in Gerado Fioris, Matoma, Natso Machigingo Chernaya. Oh, Tagbart, Narampe, Matapi, Na Yerpotan, the Ningi Lupo, the Tagbari, some new zones, so don't they? They now gin the Lupo Koran, Tagbayella, Nema Ninchigla, Gingo Chatswana, Ji, Omare. There is in a catchy religion to Girni Dopio, Pigimsenki, Kale Kaleshini, Tracker, near my youth, Telas of Batanche, Shongopio Bade, or Tedishini, Matapaze, Tedis, D. Matapi, Mardupi, Chu, Kayon, Konzoko, Natsu. The Kunzokichu, Yushin Katobli Shawa, Tamchela, Di Machapa Kayo, yes. Did you say you're not Pentok? Yeah, the pairs for the Mubuchuni Tong Kambachi Hako, you need to do heat and mark up into heat a yona, pay much to be tela tinny, seven of some of the Tama watching Gerado Kyore in Matwa. Young at the new drama watching Jan Gerado Kyore or Teddy Race. Yes, so impermanence. She said, that is the nature of reality. And when we say impermanence, it means all, everything that is composite, which means everything in that is a product of causes and conditions, is impermanent, meaning that its nature is of constant change. The opposite of impermanent is the concept of permanence which would mean if something were permanent, it would mean it is not a product of causes and conditions and therefore is forever the same. And there is nothing in our world that is permanent. And so when we look at impermanence, it's beginning to develop um, a kind of a healthy relationship of perceiving the way things are. And there are two kinds of impermanence. There's perceptible impermanence and imperceptible impermanence. Perceptible impermanence is everything that we see that changes. And so any change that becomes perceptible to us, we can see like changes in our environment, in the elements of the earth and constituents of the earth and everything around us, the changing of the seasons, the you know the the fact that wealth is either accumulated or lost that everything that is born everyone who is born will end up dying that every object that we encounter even just our kitchen cups then what it was produced and it will end at some point or other it has an inevitable end and and so then all of the perceptible forms of change that we see then are what we call perceptible impermanence. And those are only possible 
because of the imperceptible, subtle, continuous impermanence that is always the case down to the smallest, subtle most moments of time. Even when we snap a finger, Rinpoche said, in fact, that could be divided into many subtler moments of time. And each of those is a moment of change. And so the relative reality of our experience is that everything's nature is changing. Which means, for example, when we get old, that didn't just happen at a certain kind of period on the time scale of our life. But actually, every single second of our life, our body is changing. Aging is taking place. It wasn't like we were youthful and then suddenly we were old. But each moment of our life was a process of changing that led to, you know, white hair and wrinkles and all those things that many of us have aversion to. But it didn't just happen in a moment. It happened from the moment we were born. Aging was taking place. And so this is kind of like the reality of everything is that there is no phenomena in our relative experience that is not impermanent that and that means that everything is permeated by a continuous change that is not only changes that are obvious but the obvious changes are due to the continuous subtle most momentary change that is always taking place the purpose and value of starting to relate to everything in terms of impermanence is that so that impermanence is the way things are it's the reality and so then we tend to suffer over things because we struggle against that when we think of it as being permanent or it should be lasting and so forth and so as we relate more and more to things according to the way they are such as being impermanent then our that that perception then is um, corresponds to how things are and so then our mind it is more realistic about the way things are. It changes our whole mind's way of thinking in relation to them. And when our way of thinking changes, then that decreases the amount of disturbing emotions and negative thoughts we have and increases our sort of acceptance of the way things are and our ability to relate to and to cope with them as they are. And so it's uh, another contemplation that is highly effective in training our mind in terms of decreasing our negative thoughts and emotions and increasing our positive qualities. What final thoughts would Rinpoche like to leave with our listeners today? Yeah, <laughs> The Natsusemte uh Rumor 
so thank you, Rambashe said. I I um I just want to, I guess in these final moments, just um say that when we look at the title of this book, The Power of Mind, which is full of methods for working with our mind that we call mind training, then the basis of this is that is is that our the power of our mind is such that we actually have the power in our own mind to overcome and find freedom from all of our suffering and our mental afflictions. And we have the power in our own mind to find a, a true peace and happiness within ourselves. And it really is up to our mind and the power of our mind that we access the potential within ourselves for doing this. And so the reason why we suffer over things is because then our mind is under the influence, under the power of other circumstances. And when we, when our mind gains its own power, is no longer dependent upon the conditions it can find, it has the power to find freedom from those circumstances. And so for as long as we're completely dependent and under the power of other circumstances, forms, sounds, tastes, sense, tactile sensations, and stuck in that perception about how our experience is controlled by the circumstances and the thoughts of I and my and all of our grasping and attachment to those circumstances and our fears and our worries and anxieties and disturbing emotions and so forth. All of that is because our mind is is under the power of the circumstances, is controlled by or under the power of other circumstances. Like if we think of a cell phone, for example, how much then it, you know, it just, we put it next to us all the time and then we're constantly going to it. And so basically we're being controlled by our cell, our, we're allowing our mind to be controlled by our cell phones, <laughs> just as an example. But um, essentially then, we cannot find freedom from suffering for as long as our experience and our our mind's experience is dependent upon the external circumstances. We'll always be afflicted. And so I have one final quote that I'd like to leave you and everyone with, which is this. Having power over our own mind is happiness. Being controlled by or being under the power of other is suffering. And so beginning to recognize this, that for as long as we're dependent on other circumstances, then our, for our mental well-being and so forth, then we will always have a struggle. But our mental well-being isn't dependent upon those conditions. We can, if we gain power over our mind through working with our mind, then our mind's happiness and well-being is not subject to the circumstances. And we can no longer be harmed by those conditions. And this is because our mind's actual nature is not a state of affliction. Our mind's actual nature is not inherently flawed. It's not negative. It isn't all of this suffering and pain. Our mind's actual innate and pure nature is a state of peacefulness and of well-being and contains all the potentials for all positive qualities. And these are the, these are inherent to us because it's our mind's own nature. And that is what we want to uncover or reveal within ourselves. And that's when we discover the power of our own mind. And so that's what I'd like to share with everyone today. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rinpoche. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Power of the Mind. The Power of the Mind is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. 
If you'd like to learn more about his work and be part of his community, visit his website, katog.org. We're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.